Kicking off the list at number 10, Silver Banshee. First appearing in Action Comics 595 and in usual comic book fashion, she's immediately catcalled by some gross dudes. She literally looks like a demon and the guy in the middle is like, eh, tall broads, I love them. Huh. She proceeds to choke the life out of him because she has this fancy ability where one touch is all it takes to kill you. Neat. Heads up 7-Up would be an extreme sport with Siobhan. So she keeps on walking, she continues to a bookstore, of course killing another dude by, you know, palming his head for a hot second. People run out of the store and they're talking about her voice, how it's the weirdest sound that they've ever heard. See, it's not her touch that kills, it's her voice. See, in IMAX, this would just be a treat. Just a woman screaming into the camera for four hours. I'll take it, debit. She's not to be messed with. She straight up killed Superman in her first comic book appearance. This is why you try and avoid curses when you're a child, or else you turn into a silver banshee and then in turn you have no friends, which is no fun. Number nine, Knockout. First appearing in comics with Superboy Volume 4, Knockout was a dancer working at a club called the Boom Boom Room. It's clear right off the bat that she possesses super strength. But she was having fun at this club. She saw Superboy on TV and thought that he was a little cutie. In fact, she actually doesn't believe that Superboy has ever met a girl like her in his life. And she's probably right. She fought Superboy a bit because she was into it, but later on she was much more of a threat when she joined the Suicide Squad for missions against the crime cartel Silicon Dragons. Once issued two rolls around, flirting turns into something pretty serious. She's fighting Superboy and she says that she's glad that she lives here now. Here, so where did she used to live? Well, she used to live in Apocalypse. Fun fact, she was also one of Granny Goodness's female furies, but after Big Barda left with Mr. Miracle, she too decided that she wanted out. And she was punished for this, of course, so she got chained up to the walls of the fire pits, but eventually she broke free. The second she broke free, she leaped into the fire, and then she was transported via boom tube to Hawaii. And before we continue on with this list, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up because it really does help us out quite a bit and also we're on a part three so if you want to keep seeing more of these keep hitting that thumbs up then we know what to do you're the best now back to this list Number eight, Ultra Humanite. Superman's first recurring nemesis during the 40s, and yes, I'm even talking before Lex Luthor. Buckle up. This genius made his first appearance in Action Comics 13 way back in 1939. His real name wasn't known at first, Mr. Mysterious Man, but this man was gifted with one of the greatest criminal minds ever. He even developed low-level telepathy. He was a hard thinker, but his physical body couldn't keep up, and he quickly became old and withered, so he got other people to do his deeds. That was him in the old days. Now, Ultra Humanite in Power Girl Volume 2 is much different. Here, his name is Gerard Shugel, same scientific origin, same failing body, yada yada. But if it wasn't obvious, this time around, he experimented with some animals in his origin, and he moved his powerful brain into a massive white gorilla's body. We have Gorilla Grodd in the CW-verse, so maybe we'll get a mighty gorilla genius in the DCEU. Sounds terrifying. Never say never. Number seven, Solomon Grundy. Killed in 1895 and then tossed into a swamp. Rough. Cyrus Gold was gone for 50 years before he came back to life. We're talking zombies now, let's do it. He made his first appearance in All American Comics issue 61. Cyrus was having an affair at the time and met up with Rachel, the other girl, to talk about what they're going to do now that she's pregnant. So Rachel wanted money in order to keep quiet and Cyrus wasn't on board. So Rachel's friend stepped out of the bushes, hit Solomon on the head and he fell into Slaughter Swamp, great name for a swamp, where he would then lay dead for 50 years. Over time, Gold's body started to mix with the sour vegetation of the, you know, slaughter swamp. So he was just churning and turning into a zombie. He came back as a zombie beast with no recollection of his past life. So when he stumbles across a camp, the only thing he can remember when asked his name was that he was born on a Monday. Oddly specific, but we're here for it. The other guy who asked his name mentions the nursery rhyme, Solomon Grundy, born on a Monday. Is that, could it be? And it rhymes, therefore it stays. Number six, Emerald Empress. Making its first appearance in Adventure Comics 352, the Emerald Eye of Ekron is an extremely powerful weapon. Right off the bat, I gotta talk about this. It's one of the best to ever exist in the universe. It's similar to the Green Lantern Power Ring, so when Saria gets a hold of it, trouble ensues. Originally from the planet Vengar, the Emerald Empress was the most wanted female criminal in the history of the universe. Which, I mean, put that on her resume, that's, that's a pretty big achievement. Her homeworld was the site of the long dead Ekron civilization, whose secrets were supposedly lost all for the Emerald Eye of Ekron, of course. The Eye will do whatever Saria wants it to, and it follows her around and gives her the ability to fly and hang out in space safely. The Eye fixes itself after it breaks, so don't think about hitting it with a big hammer and then calling it a day. The Eye has taken down Superboy before, and if we don't have a Green Lantern in the DCEU yet, I think it might be too soon for the Emerald Empress to start eyeballing the League, perhaps. Number five. Poison Ivy. Bridget Regan has recently been cast as Poison Ivy in Batwoman on the CW, so perhaps she could join the DCEU soon as well. 
Fingers crossed on that one. When it comes to powerful villains, Pamela Isley packs a mean green punch. She made her first appearance in the pages of Batman back in issue 181. Now she began her days as an only child to a wealthy family, hot start already, but by the time she reached college, she was studying botany. She eventually fell in love with one of her professors, Mark Legrand, and one day she went so far to steal some special herbs from a museum in order to help him with an experiment. But of course, Mark was the worst guy in existence and used that herb to poison Pamela. She of course became immune to all diseases and toxins after this, those were her original origins. Now her post-crisis origins were even darker. Can you imagine? That professor this time around was Jason Woodrow, later known as the Floronic Man, made Pamela a test subject for experiments. So straight up torture in her origins. This made her even darker once she did get her abilities, and this time around she hated men as well. So she would seduce them with her powers and make them do the crimes. She once made her boyfriend grow fun guy in his lungs while he was driving. And I couldn't think of a worse way to go. Fun guy? I'm gonna throw up. Number four, Killer Frost. Crystal Frost, the OG version, made her first appearance back in Firestorm issue three. She was a student at Hudson University who fell in love with one of her professors, only he was married, so he wasn't really interested. Crystal, after this, was upset. She was rejected, and now she wants to start hating every dude on the planet as well. Later on, she was a scientist working in the Arctic, where she again was reunited with that same professor. Then she accidentally got locked inside a thermo frost chamber, and then in comic book fashion, got the ability to project waves of freezing cold air. Cool. Frozone, but with attitude. We love it. Her first goal was to take out that professor, but he was one half of the superhero Firestorm. So she was beat at first, but once she met up with the secret society of supervillains, she was able to go head to head with the Justice League. Louise Lincoln's version of Killer Frost was in Batman Assault on Arkham, and a good amount of those Suicide Squad members are now in the DCEU. So hopefully we see her soon. It could happen. She's next in line. Number three, Barbatos. Also referred to as the Bat God, hey -o, this epic force resides in the dark multiverse. Now we're getting more into the big guys, I guess. So the World Forger was set to watch over the vast universes, and while some of them held up in their own ways, there are some worlds that just were naturally unstable. So what do you do next? You get a giant stick and then poke them and push them out of the universe? No, of course not. You send a dragon to destroy it. That way, the energy can then return to said forge. Not a bad gig. Now, sometimes you like your job a little bit too much, you know, destroying planets and all. And this was the case for said Bat God. He ended up killing his master, and that was just the kickoff. He then had a real taste for destruction, and then he corrupted the Forge of Worlds. So now, with the Bat God not destroying these worlds and sending that energy back sometimes, these worlds would end up becoming part of the Dark Universe. His journey begins with Dark Days, the casting issue one, and it's mind bending. Go check it out. Number two, Cyborg Superman. Hank Henshaw made his first appearance in Adventures of Superman issue 465. He was a scientist, astronaut, team leader of the Excalibur crew. He was joined on this LexCorp space mission by his wife and two others. Now they hit some cosmic radiation and in turn their shuttle crashed. Two of the passengers' bodies turned into cosmic radiation, then the other turned into a gravel spaceship part anomaly, which I gotta say, one gets cosmic powers, the other turns into a bunk bed, Ben Grimm. That's not fair at all. Hank's wife, Terry, was one of the four hit with the cosmic radiation, but she seemed fine afterwards for, for a little bit, that's important. Hank's hair also only turned white, so they were both lucky, all things considered. The crew then went to Metropolis to use the LexCorp facilities and hopefully fix their friend and crewmate's cosmic problem. The team ended up clashing with Superman. They were all decaying rapidly. Everybody's scared, so of course they're gonna freak out a little bit. Steven flew into the sun. He felt attracted to its powers and then flew into his own death like a moth. All that cosmic stuff. He was like, mm, and then he just disappeared. Hank manages to tip Superman off right before he decays, so they were only able to save Terry. Jim didn't want to live as a space shuttle rock cluster anymore, so he walked into a MRI scanner, just ended his own life. Really tragic stuff. Terry was now the only survivor of this cosmic nightmare, but in Adventures of Superman issue 468, it was revealed Hank lived through iCloud. Basically, he transferred his consciousness to LexCorp's mainframe and then he took over NASA's equipment and beamed his mind into the birthing matrix, the pod that carried Superman from Krypton to Earth. So now he was able to travel the cosmos and just learn about local life forms and their history. He eventually came to the conclusion that Superman was in fact evil and he needed to be stopped. After Superman died battling Doomsday, Hank claimed to be Superman Reborn, and of course, people bought it, because look at him. This is why you back your phone up, people, in case you become an astronaut and your best friend turns into a ball of space junk. You don't want that happening. 
And finally, number one, Mr. Mixelplek. This man of mystery made his first dazzling appearance in Superman Volume 2, Issue 11. At first sight, he seems like an ordinary man with an excellent beard and jawline. He's in the office with Lois and Clark, he's the new guy, and right as Lois and Clark are about to leave and go for their lunch date, this random dude starts to rub Lois's feet. Normal office behavior, sure. And then even weirder, Lois bails on Clark. Now she wants to go to lunch with Foot Rub Ronnie. So they go to lunch and they come back four hours later and at this point Lois still doesn't know anything about this man somehow. She's oblivious also to a grill attack that's taking place behind her. So she's in a daze, something is afoot. And then he turns Lois into a mannequin. So what's happening right now? What, who is this guy? This man is in fact not a hunk, he's actually an imp from the fifth dimension. Close enough. His real name doesn't even translate into Earth's languages, but we collectively pronounce it as Mr. Mixelplik. He can manipulate anything and everything. He's nigh omnipotent and he's into feet. I think this guy is way too much for the DCEU in any way. Kicking off the list at number 10, Giganta. Dora Zool made her first appearance in Wonder Woman Volume 2, Issue 126. She's a supersized villain. She's literally a giant, if her name didn't already tip you off for that. She was once suffering from a fatal blood disease, so in order to try and save herself, she attempted to transfer her life essence into the body of Wonder Woman, which I gotta say, great call. As far as vessels go, that's a pretty good one to use. Because Wonder Woman at this time was in a coma. She was being held at the experimental medical facility where Zool was working, so it kinda, you know, it was worth a shot. Now during this process, Wonder Girl came in and interrupted it, so instead Zool's life essence was transferred into a giant test gorilla named Giganta. I can't even say that with a straight face. So instead, Zool's life essence was now transferred into a giant test gorilla named Giganta. Oops. Now, of course, this was a no-go, so her next idea was to transfer herself again, but this time to a strong circus lady named Olga. The transfer worked, and Doris could now turn into a giant because Olga apparently could do so before. I think we're okay without giants. I think anything with giants, we're just gonna keep out. If it doesn't have a cape, then no, <laughs> that's it. Number nine, Psycho Pirate. Psycho Pirate. Charles Halstead made his first appearance at All-Star Comics issue 23. He first showed up in the golden age of comics. He was originally an employee of Rex Morgan, who ran a newspaper company called The Daily Career. He wanted more success, of course, so he made the alias Psycho Pirate, and he started to use emotions as a theme for crimes. That sounds intimidating, I think. So the Justice Society would solve crimes based on emotions. That doesn't sound too powerful for the DCEU. If anything, it sounds a little boring where we're heading now. The new Psycho Pirate came out in Superboy Volume 6, Issue 23, and he was much different. Roger Hayden can now control emotions, which is a big upgrade. Psycho Pirate is aware that the universes have changed, like he saw the nature of reality die and then get reborn, like New Crisis, Flashpoint, all that good stuff. He was just stuck in the universe, watching it all fold and then unfold Again. The reality created by Dr. Manhattan's timeline tampering had Roger as a member of the 20, a group of Metropolis citizens infected with Brainiac's psionic virus. So now Hayden can alter your emotions using the Medusa mask. He's getting better and better. The first mask was an artifact stolen from the Metropolis Museum of Art. That mask gave him godly abilities, and we see this in Superman Volume 3, Issue 24. Now the second mask used was from Batman Volume 3, and that mask was more of a tool to help him channel his own ability to change others' emotions. Medusa Mask or Majora's Mask? Which would you rather own? close one. And before we continue on with this list, you know the drill. Go ahead and give us a thumbs up. If you're loving this part two, which you should be if you're still on board, those likes surely add up and help us out here at the studio. So thank you so much. Now let's get right back to this list. Number eight, Super Doom. Coming from Earth 45, this Superman was a project gone wrong. He first appeared in Action Comics Volume 2, Issue 9, when Jimmy Olsen created a machine that turns thoughts into reality. All these thought machines and emotion machines, it's a bit odd, but I like it. So the gang decided to make a robot Superman next with that machine. They ended up selling this device to Overcorp, which made it into Superman The Last Night of Tomorrow, aka the monstrous Super Doom. Overcorp used him to take over the planet, but still, that wasn't enough. Super Doom entered the bleed space, where he would then search the multiverse for its creators. Destroying planets and other versions of Superman, like Optiman of Earth-36 and Superman of Earth-42. But eventually, he came to Earth-23 and had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with their Superman President Calvin Harris. I'm all for evil Supermans in a nightmare sequence, but Super Doom might be a little bit too much. I don't know. Number seven, Relic. 
Ancient enemy of the Green Lantern Corps, Relic made his first appearance in Green Lantern Volume 5, Issue 21. He's been around for a while, like before space time. I'm talking like a while, while. Before all this, he was a scientist in his universe who believed that harnessing the emotional electromagnetic spectrum was a bad idea. He figured it would lead to tragedy, and given others on this list, I have to say, he was kind of onto something. So he thought all these other lightsmiths were drawing their power from a specific place, and eventually that place would run dry. Guy's a futurist, what can I say? So he searched the cosmos far and wide trying to prove his own theory, and he had universal support backing it. But nothing was jumping out at him. There was no solutions. He didn't really come across anything until one by one the seven core lightsmiths began losing their powers. The only living being left after that war was a lone green lightsmith. So Relic then passed to the next universe and he was remade as a giant, kind of like Dorzul. We love giants. He was first found by White Lantern Kyle Rayner in the Templar Guardians. But he didn't want what happened to the lightsmiths to happen here, so he traveled to Oa where he warned the Green Lantern Corps that they should surrender their power rings. And they of course were like, no, get out of here, peace. And then in turn, Relic forcefully drained their powers and destroyed their planet. Either one way or another, I guess it's happening. Okay, Relic, sure. Number six. Volthoom. Making his first appearance in Green Lantern Annual Volume 5, Issue 1, Volthoom was an ancient force that had the ability to warp reality. Sweet. He was originally from Earth-15 and after his world was on the brink of destruction, so him and his mother used the newly discovered emotional electromagnetic spectrum, which is a multiversal force powered by all life in the multiverse, and then they used this power to create the Travel Lantern, and Volthoom left to find safety while his mother stayed behind and unfortunately, in superhero fashion, died right as he left. This first lantern traveled for weeks through space and time in desperate hopes to find something, something to save his home. So he goes to Earth-17 and he uses the spectrum to resurrect plant life, which is cool, but then next he travels to Earth-47 and they use the spectrum to create beautiful music, also pretty cool, and then he went to Earth-3 where he met a sorcerer named Mordu in which he creates a power ring out of a piece of his soul, that ring of course being called the Ring of Volthum. You're not gonna name it after somebody else, so it's only fair. He finally found Earth-0 where he acted as the law and order, eventually Volthum's mind was corrupted from the spectrum and he became insane. I feel like anybody who has a ring in general just ends up going insane. Like Lord of the Rings, it's like, come on. Number five, Atrocitus. What a name, okay, he must be a gentle soul. Atrocitus entered DC Comics back in Green Lantern Volume 4, Issue 25. He is the leader and founder of the Red Lantern Corps, the Red Power Ring fueled by nothing else but rage. So since the death of his family, he's been after the guardians of the universe. His family was residing in the ever so peaceful sector, 666. Krona, one of the guardians of the universe who I talked about in part one, reprogrammed manhunters to extinguish life. So when they all went nuts, this was one of the many worlds destroyed. He was one of the five survivors left on sector 666, so together they became the five inversions. They soon became known as the Empire of Tears, which sounds like a punk rock boy band, but in reality, they were performing rituals to see the future, like the Blackest Night Prophecy and stuff like that. Atrocitus created the Red Lantern Corps, but he's also really known for corrupting Sinestro. Number four, Oblivion. Making his first appearance in Green Lantern New Guardians Annual Issue 2 back in 2014, Oblivion is made of Kyle Rayner's rage, fear, and anxiety, all rolled into one. Lovely. He's the physical form of all those traits, and he even believed himself to be Kyle Rayner. He stayed at this guy's apartment and he even tricked Carol into thinking that he was the real deal. He has powers that allow him to shapeshift, obviously, but he can also teleport and project vast amounts of energy that match a white lantern. He can also create illusions of objects and people. He can make anything he wants. You're gonna be very confused if you go on a dinner date with this guy. One day, Oblivion teleported Carol and himself to Arizona, where he used his powers to change everybody's appearance and he even changed buildings all around him. No thanks, we don't want any of that in the DCEU. Sounds fun, but sounds kind of unfixable. Number three, Mongol. The insane ruler of war worlds. Yeah, he's for sure making this list. He first appeared back in the 80s in DC Comics Presents issue 27. He first appeared back in the 80s in DC Comics Presents issue 27. He was a Superman villain who was exiled into outer space by his own people. A man called the Archimandrite came along, took it over, and from that point on, the planet was just a cruel wasteland. Mongol drifted through space, and over his cosmic commute, he picked up immense powers along the way until he eventually arrived on the fifth planet of the Cygnus system, where the Martian race protected the Crystal Key. The crystal 
Crystal Key was the only way to gain access to the planet Warworld. So Mongo kidnapped Jimmy Olsen, Lois Lane, and Steve Lombard in order to get Superman to punch those Martians out of the way. Martian Manhunter ended up freeing Superman's friends, but by the time everything was done, they were all so low energy that they still couldn't fight Mongol, so he got the key and teleported away. It took both Superman and Supergirl to destroy War World, but Mongol ended up escaping anyways. I think I like this guy, but he might be a bit too strong for the DCEU, but hey, never say never. Number two. Kronos. If you do the crime, you're doing the time, but if you have enough time, you can plan said crime out in detail and maybe you won't even get caught for that crime. Confused? That's what time does. David Clinton first entered DC Comics with the Atom issue 3. He's mainly a villain for Ray Palmer. Now he was a criminal his entire life, but finally he was arrested, thrown in the slammer where he had time to think. Maybe a bit too much time because then he reflected on all of his past crimes and what he would have done differently had he planned it better. And he used his skills and obsessions with timepieces to work nonstop in the prison workshop. So we learned about Crocs, time, anything, the mechanisms within them, all that good stuff. And when his sentence was up, he was released and then became a time traveling villain. He used time inspired weapons, like literally, he used an exploding hourglass or a wristwatch filled with blades instead of hands. And he also had a device that could literally slow down time. And then he started going by the new name, Kronos. In the DC animated universe, he used these devices to go back in time and steal rare relics from the past. At one point, he tried stealing a utility belt from the Justice League's watchtower, but when he was interrupted, he made a break for it through a time vortex, but Green Lantern, Batman, and Wonder Woman followed him back through there. We mentioned a time guy on part one, so part two, we gotta throw another one in. It's the law. And finally, number one, Grail. We finally got to see Darkseid in the Snyder Cut, but is it too soon perhaps if we meet his daughter? Am I asking for too much? I don't know. She's pretty badass. She made her comic book debut in Justice League Volume 2, Issue 40, back in 2015. She was born at the exact same time as Wonder Woman in Divergence, Issue 1. The Amazonian assassin Marina gave birth to Grail in secret with help from Penelope and Menelipe. Marina had to defend her child because Penelope heard the prophecy from Menelipe, so apparently this child would cause mass destruction when she grew up. Okay, sure. Marina took Menelipe out, so she wasn't really a concern anymore, but afterwards, Marina left the mascara with her daughter, making it the first time Amazons have left the island. In Justice League Volume 2, Issue 40, Grail teamed up with the Anti-Monitor and declared war on her own father. Nice. Being a hybrid of an Amazon and a new god, she's got powers from both. It's quite intimidating. She's destroyed Wonder Woman's bracelets with Omega Beams, and she can travel through dimensions by locking onto those connected to the Speed Force. She can literally hitch a ride through time, so there's no winning this battle, either in the future or the past. The list at number 10, The Time Trapper. First appearing in Adventure Comics 317, The Time Trapper comes from the far future. He actually prevented the legion of superheroes from traveling into their future using an iron curtain of time. He likes to hang out at his home located safely at the end of time. How neat is that? Kind of similar to Kang. In his first few issues, The Time Trapper was seeking the Concentrator, which was a weapon that draws energy, any energy source in the known universe, together. It's also a pretty big secret as well. The Time Trapper pretended to be the commissioner of the science police and tortured the Legionnaires, although they said it was a test in order to gain intel. Now, Lightning Lad knew something was fishy, so he cracked and spilled secrets, false ones, of course. So this brought the team to actually figure out how to assemble the real Concentrator. And when an angry Time Trapper returned, he launched a plethora of dark stars at the crew, but luckily that Concentrator could absorb any energy source, like I said, so they were blasted out of existence. We're good. The Legion lived to tell the tale, but we just got Kang in the MCU, so I don't think we need another Time Lord showing up. My brain hurts enough already. Give us like five years and then bring in some more time stuff. Number nine, Eclipso. Making his first appearance in House of Secrets issue 61, Eclipso was made from God's spirit of wrath. He's the living embodiment of wrath. It doesn't get more menacing than that, folks. He was made to punish the wicked, to clean the world of evil, of course, until the specter replaced him. Wrath was driven by anger, whereas vengeance, that required more of a discerning hand. So what happened after was wrath's physicality was trapped within an all black diamond called the heart of darkness. The heart of darkness, kind of like the heart of the ocean, but instead of Rose tossing it overboard, a treasure hunter found it in Africa and accidentally split it into a thousand pieces. And now we're all 
Each of those pieces contained a shard of darkness. So Eclipso figured out a way to possess people through these diamonds, and that first man being possessed was Bruce Gordon. Bruce was a scientist specializing in solar energy. While he was in a jungle observing a solar eclipse, a sorcerer named Mofir attacked him with one of those black diamonds, and after that, every eclipse, Eclipso would take over Bruce. Unbeknownst to Bruce though, Eclipso would soon learn to bind himself to anybody near any shard that happened to be angry at the time. Nowadays, there's a lot of angry folks, so this is bad news. The Entity of wrath possessing anybody who gets upset, that sounds, yeah, just smile and wave, I guess. Just lie. Just lie and pretend you're happy. Then you're good. Before we continue on with this list, if you want to spread the love and hit that thumbs up, it really does wonders for us at the channel. You guys are amazing. Thanks so much for watching. Let's keep, let's keep this going. Number eight, Justice Lord Superman. Coming from the animated universe, the 2003 Justice League episode titled A Better World showed us one that's rather the opposite. This parallel universe showed Kal-El and the Justice Lord storming the White House after President Lex Luthor had just executed the Flash. Now the team of course wasn't too happy, so Batman and Wonder Woman fought off the Secret Service while Superman told Luthor that he's taken him in. Lex is insane, so we had a button ready that could literally start a nuclear war if it was pressed. And he's threatening Superman Superman, saying that he needs to use deadly force if he wants to save the people. So Superman's like, okay, and then just eyes glow red, and then he turns them into ashes, just like that. And when Batman and Wonder Woman come back in, it's, well, it's far too late. Superman just has a smile on his face, and Lex is just a pile of dust. Good times. After this, for the next two years, the Justice Lords would rule using violence like it was normal. They saw this and they're like, well, that certainly did the trick. Let's just keep doing that. Justice Lord Superman used his heat vision to wipe out all of Earth's criminals and villains. If we had him in the DCEU, the movie would be a lot shorter than four hours. It would be like 36 minutes. Snatter cut, maybe 44 minutes. Number seven, Superboy Prime, another super menace. First appearing in DC Comics Presents issue 87, this version of Supes has more powers and less weaknesses. I'm talking immunity to kryptonite and magic, which is a Fantastic combo. He arrived to Earth and was soon discovered by Jerry and Naomi Kent while they were on a hike in a New England seacoast town. They named him Clark, although Clark Kent was the name of a popular comic book hero named Superman. So yeah, Superman already existed on this Earth, so Clark grew up and later attended a costume party at a beach and dressed like Superman. He went to get a glimpse of Haley's Comet and it was all a good time, then all of a sudden a tidal wave hits, this portal opens up, and the Superman from the comics pops out. Now at the same time, young Clark's powers may manifested and he quickly learned what to do with them in the moment. Superboy then followed that Superman back into the portal to an alternate reality and he would never be the same again. Crisis on Infinite Earths was this multiversal catastrophe where parallel dimensions were being consumed by the Anti-Monitor who I'll talk about later. Superboy dove in, joined the fight, but was unable to prevent the destruction of his Earth. So Superboy Prime and other survivors escaped to a paradise dimension that Alexander Luther Jr. offered. Using crystals, Superboy just relived happy times in this paradise, but eventually he got frustrated and shattered the barrier of reality. He literally punched everything apart. He retconned quite a bit in DC continuity. For example, he brought back Jason Todd, he combined Superman's origins, Doom Patrol was now rebooted, and we had numerous incarnations of Hawk Man and the League of Superheroes. I feel like DC could use a big bad Superboy Prime Punch to clear up the timeline, but hopefully the Flash movie does that, because this guy is just a little, a little too crazy. Number six, Brainiac. Another close rival of Superman's, Brainiac made his first appearance in Action Comics 242. This guy right off the bat is a very specific villain. He would love to steal cities. Yeah, watch out for your cities, keep them safe, put them under your mattress. He took Metropolis at one point, this guy's wild. He would use his shrinking ray, zoom, shrink your city, and then take them back to his planet. Vril Doc started his days as a scientist, and one day he successfully cloned himself because he needed an assistant, so who better to hire than yourself? He built the spaceship next and traveled to the cosmos, gaining knowledge and studying alien organisms with the help of his robot drones. And during these travels, he came across Krypton while General Zod was still running the show. So of course, this dude shrunk down the entire city of Kandor and studied it in his ship. He made a remote scout unit that believed it was the original real docks, and then it traveled to Earth and took over the body of sideshow mentalist Milton Fine, whose stage name was Brainiac. Now it makes sense. Number five, Necron. Also known as the Lord of the Unliving, 
great. Nakarad made his first appearance in Tales of the Green Lantern Corps issue 2. He's literally the embodiment of death. Nakarad figured out the land of the living existed after the death of an immortal caused a rift to open between dimensions. So Necron saw all this life and he was like, mmm, this looks tasty. He wanted it. Well, really he wanted to master it and get out of his hell. His literal hell that he was living in. So he resurrected Krona, even throwing in a classy army of the dead to assist in taking down the guardians of the universe. Taking them down ended up widening the rift, though it took all the Green Lantern Corps to stop them, but even after winning, countless lives were lost in this fight. Hal Jordan ended up going to the land of the unliving, accepting the possibility that he may just never return, and there he gathered the souls of other fallen lanterns and it was just enough to fight off Necron and return, with the Guardians sealing the rift promptly afterwards. But like Necron says, you can never defeat death. Back in 2009, it was revealed Necron was behind the Black Lanterns and instigated the Blackest Night event. There he took over the bodies of Wonder Woman and Superman while also bringing back dead heroes to join his side. Number four, Prometheus. Helmets are pretty important, especially in combat. And especially if one helmet in particular gave you the skills to beat, I don't know, Batman? Prometheus first appeared in New Year's Evil, Prometheus issue one back in the late 90s. And at first he was just the son of two criminals who traveled across the US, real Bonnie and Clyde style. But as a kid, he would have to go with them, right? Because they couldn't afford a babysitter. They were rich with like mob money, but they couldn't afford a babysitter. Okay, so eventually the police caught on and they were never seen again. The police killed them in front of the boy, almost like a darker Bruce Wayne origin. So he grew up with their fortune, only it was a stolen fortune. Then he traveled the world, trained as a fighter, trained as a mercenary. He learned a dozen different languages and he was pretty skilled by the end of it. Then he found the ancient city of Shambhala where their monks studied evil. They trusted him and showed him their greatest treasure, which was an alien ship. Not too bad. Their leader was actually an alien in disguise. He landed there, but Prometheus had to kill him to obtain the key to enter the ghost zone. The ghost zone was his infinite expanse of white emptiness, the space between dimensions. Kryptonians called this the phantom zone. And in there, Prometheus built himself a house, a costume, and his first advanced helmet that downloads info to take on the Justice League. He was great. Like He shot Martian Manhunter so then he couldn't change he infected Steel's armor with a virus, he hypnotized Huntress, and he hit Green Lantern with a neural shaft so his ring was useless. He also trapped Zuriel in said ghost zone and beat Batman with hand-to-hand -hand combat. Not too shabby at all. Number three, the Batman who laughs. We've seen quite a few Batman on screen. We're even seeing Michael Keaton return to Gotham in the next Flash movie, which is pretty exciting. But the Batman who laughs, AKA the Darkest Knight, might be a bit too hardcore for the theaters. Coming from the Dark Multiverse, first appearing in Dark Days, the casting, created by Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo, comes a twisted Earth-22 version of the Batman, the Batman who laughs. The Joker here is insane. He goes on the spree throughout Gotham, just chaos in the streets. He took out Jim Gordon, then he poisoned Batman, all bad, and then once Batman was able to move again after the poison had run its course, he broke the Joker's neck, which is already immediately so dark. But even the Joker was prepared after death. After that snap, he let out this toxic breath that let everybody near him get infected, including Batman. Cut to two days later, Batman and Superman are talking about what happened, and when Superman tells Bruce that a kid infected by Joker bit a doctor, Bruce ends up laughing, like this maniacal laugh. And he catches himself after, he's like, <clears throat> sorry about that. Superman knows something's off here, but a day later, Bruce called the team to the Batcave and went full on Omni-Man. He took out the entire team before anybody caught on to his new and violent personality. Number two, the Anti-Monitor. Making his first appearance in Crisis on Infinite Earths issue two, the Anti-Monitor was DC's excuse to cut out a lot of fat from the comics, basically. The multiverse was introduced back in the 60s. The Golden Age heroes were residing on Earth 2, and then came Earth 3, and then so on and Danforth. So when Crisis on Infinite Earths came around, DC Comics introduced this big bad cosmic villain to set something straight going forward. Clean up the multiple timelines, makes sense. Now it all started when Krona performed this experiment. They wanted to see the origin of the universe, but instead an opposite universe was created, the Antimatter universe. Antimonitor wanted nothing but death and destruction, and after battle his brother for, say, I don't know, a billion years, they both fell unconscious. And then nine billion years later, they were woken up. When they tried to destroy Earth-1, many heroes lost their lives, and in order to stop that chaos, Superman had to punch them into a star. Who knows, with the Flash opening up the multiversal door, we could see him on the big screen in our lifetime. Maybe. Maybe. 
And finally, number one, Perpetua. Of course, one of the most feared beings in the greater Omniverse. Also known as the first creator, she made her first appearance in Justice League Volume 4, Issue 8. She was the mother of the Monitor, Anti-Monitor, and World Folder. She was actually one of the hands that created the multiverse, literally. Each member were these celestial beings and they would pass on and their energy would return to the source, but Perpetua was different. She wanted a dark, vicious reality that would live forever. So she created the first iteration of the multiverse using negative crisis energy and then had three cosmic children. She was creating an army also to rule over the multiverse, so her children snitched. Yeah, they told the judges of the source and Perpetua was locked away outside the source wall with her negative energies. But even locked away, she was able to connect to Lex Luthor who believed freeing her would make him a hero on some multiversal scale. So next time you wanna kick somebody out of your party, just banish them to the source wall with their negative energy. Number 10, Blockbuster. Blockbuster might not be an A-list bat villain, but I don't think I've ever mentioned him him on this channel before, and I thought it was about time that we gave him a little shout out. We see you, Blockbuster, we see you. While not one of the most popular Bat villains, Blockbuster still packs a mighty punch. The current incarnation of the villain is Roland Desmond, who has reappeared in the Prime Earth continuity throughout the current Nightwing series. In fact, even though he started out of Detective Comics, he's now actually thought of more as a Nightwing villain. Even more recently resurfacing in Nightwing in issue 83. Blockbuster has also had many incarnations throughout the years since the character's first First appearance as Mark Desmond back in 1965 in Detective Comics issue 345. Some versions have been tougher and more powerful than others, but all of them have possessed some level of super strength, durability, and stamina, usually granted to them by the Blockbuster Serum, and often at the cost of some intelligence. However, the current Blockbuster does not suffer the same weakness, instead simply suffering physical pain if remaining in his transformed super buff state for too long. In a nine condiment king. Okay, before you yell at me, hear me out a little bit, okay? Condiment King may just seem like a random dude who uses ketchup and mustard as a weapon, but you have to admit that would not fit in the DCEU. The DCEU has a much darker tone than the Batman animated series Condiment King was created for, and if he was in the DCEU, they would have to make him incredibly deadly for it to work properly. This guy would basically just use allergies as a weapon, and I don't mean like the, oh, you got the sniffles and your eyes are kind of itching kind of allergies. I mean like throat closes up and eyes pop out of your head kind of allergies. They would have to turn Condiment Condiment King into such a horrific killer that he would actually end up being overpowered and probably cause a lot of controversy. Even if it was just like condiments combined with acid instead of normal condiments, that that would be absolutely nuts. You thought that they handled Doomsday bad? Wait until you see people's faces melting because they got hit with Dijon honey mustard and freaking acid. Number eight, Mr. Freeze. Mr. Freeze is Victor Freeze, a vastly underrated Batman villain in my opinion, but admittedly a hard villain to bring to the big screen. Though maybe not as hard to bring to the big screen is Condiment King. And that's not just because of his overall look and character design, but because of how capable he can be and how powerful he is. Mr. Freeze is one of the few Batman villains who actually possesses powers and isn't just a deranged criminal. Of course, he is still a deranged criminal. Mr. Freeze, in current continuity, is also a deranged scientist, who from an early age seemed to have a fixation with the cold and cryogenics. This fixation likely existed because of key tragic moments that had happened when he was younger, also taking place in and around the cold, such as his father abandoning him and his mother's fatal injury and later death at his own hands. Freeze would become so obsessed he would convince himself that he was married to the subject of the first case of cryogenic stasis, despite the fact that she was technically like a lot older than him, Nora Fields. But a change to the timeline would make it so that this was actually true and that he and Nora had in fact been together before she was frozen, so she became his real wife, meaning their relationship was no longer considered one of Victor's delusions in main continuity. Mr. Freeze is not only powerful with his ice gun and unique physiology, which allows him to freeze anything he touches and create ice structures, but he is complex and unique in appearance, meaning we likely won't see him in the DCEU anytime soon. Not that I'm saying the villains aren't complex. That wasn't like a that wasn't like a sick burn to the DCEU or anything, just to be clear. And it's seven scarecrow. The Scarecrow has made an appearance in the Dark Knight movies, however, those aren't in the DCEU, at least yet. Until this point, the closest we've gotten is the Fear Gas from the Arrowverse crossover event of Elseworlds. However, that gas made some insane hallucinations that ended up with The Flash, who at the time was Oliver Queen's speed, to be useless, which would be incredibly overpowered when it comes to the rest of the DCEU. When Oliver and Barry were fighting, Barry was landing hits on Oliver despite not having his super speed, and Oliver wasn't knocking Barry away with super speed punches. This 
being used on a greater scale like we would see Scarecrow do in an actual movie would absolutely destroy the world, especially with heroes like Superman and Martian Manhunter. And we know that this is how the Scarecrow's gas would operate in the DCEU because thanks to the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover we got confirmation that Ezra Miller's Flash and Grant Gustin's Flash exist in the same multiverse. Or perhaps the cinematic universe exists within the antimatter universe, it would explain the darker themes. Either way, we know that's how the gas would work and that would be a little too much to handle in one movie. Number 6, Bane. Bane is known for being one of Batman's all around strongest villains, but let's not forget that Bane also brings smarts to the table. Ok, so maybe not if we're counting the Harley Quinn animated series version of Bane, but comic book Bane at least is known for also possessing a brilliant mind. A lot of people forget that about him. He was the mastermind in fact behind the death of Alfred, which was also part of his scheme to break the Batman in a much more all around way. Granted, he also took out Alfred because his demands were not being met. He basically ordered Batman not to make a rescue attempt, but then Damian Wayne did make a rescue attempt because he didn't listen to the warning that was given to them, and so Alfred died by Bane's hands after Damian's attempt failed. Bane being such a massive man of muscle also makes it hard to bring him to life. He's not only a hard villain to write, but he's also a difficult one to cast and depict as well, because he just looks like literally a brick house. Halfway through in at number 5, Arkham Knight. Not only is this character loved by some of the people who played the Batman Arkham series of games, the Arkham Knight is a highly skilled military technician who possesses expert knowledge of Batman's tactics and fighting style, which can be attributed to the fact that he was personally trained by the vigilante, being revealed as Jason Todd, a moment that we all remember, for better or worse. He is a master of hand to hand combat, martial arts, and marksmanship. The high tech military like battle suit that he wears further enhances his physical strength, speed, and durability. When Batman was ambushed by the Dark Knight, he was able to knock the Dark Knight off his feet with one punch. This absolute mastery of Batman's tactics would make him a hella good villain, however the amount of power he has would probably be too much for the DCU. They already had Batman fight Superman and win, so they would have to like supercharge Arkham Knight to make it an actually interesting fight, which would just ruin the character even more than some would consider him already ruined. Number 4, Ra's al Ghul, or Ra's al Ghul, depending on what you prefer. A lot of people prefer Ra's, I prefer Ra's. We can all coexist, it's a beautiful world. Ross is one of Batman's all time greatest nemeses. While he might not possess direct superpowers of any kind, like most of Batman's rogues, he is one of the most skilled fighters and has one of the most brilliant minds. Like Bane. I like people with brilliant minds apparently. Too bad Raze usually uses his brilliant mind to concoct all sorts of schemes in order to topple governments, sow chaos, and gain power the world over. Raz al Ghul is the head of the League of Assassins and has come close to completely defeating Batman in the past, with him even successfully using Batman's own research during the Tower of Babel JLA story to defeat all of Batman's super powered colleagues on the team. Getting close to the end and in number 3, Solomon Grundy. Solomon Grundy, born on a Monday. That's what the story says. But when killed, Grundy will return and be resurrected in the swamp where he died, and then he because you know, that's that's his thing. This sort of resurrection and recurring antagonist thing doesn't really work in movies. In TV, sure it can work. Introduce the character, then have them come back once a season for an episode or two. However, with movies, those are more often than not like one-time villains that are to be dealt with and then forgotten about, unless the movie is like a two-parter or the villain ends up winning. This kind of concept has to be taken into account when thinking about who would be too overpowered in the DCEU. Solomon Grundy would be one of those villains that wouldn't realistically be a one time villain. Even if they brought him back for another movie with like a big team up of villains, it wouldn't matter because he would die and then just come back again. The story would never be over. The threat would never actually be fully handled, and that's just the way the character was written. It's great for comics and it would work okay on TV, but in movies, this guy wouldn't work in the slightest. It's unfortunate because I love Grundy as a character, but they would just ruin him like they did Arkham Knight and Doomsday. May I go on? Number 2, Poison Ivy. Poison Ivy is one of my favorite characters in the Batman universe, period. And also coincidentally, one of the most powerful villains I think that currently exists in Batman's wheelhouse. She is brewing up something huge lately in the Batman comics and is threatened basically the entire world on multiple occasions, but also has sought in the past to remind people of why she strikes out as an eco-terrorist, at times working with international science communities and political meets to fight against global warming and work towards preserving important parts of our ecosystem. However, while Poison Ivy will be coming to the Arrowverse on CW, we still have yet to have a casting for her in the DCEU, and this could be because Pamela Isley is just too crazy complicated and OP to show up there. After all, she's 
has proven before how hard she is to take on in the comics. When she took over the world, it seemed almost nothing initially, not even Batman, would be able to stop her. Finally, in at number one, the Batman Who Laughs. Being first introduced in Dark Days, the casting number one in 2017, the Batman Who Laughs was Bruce Wayne from Earth-22 of the Dark Multiverse. He was a lieutenant of Barbados, and the leader of the Dark Knights during the first Dark Multiverse invasion, and later the infected heroes of the Secret Six. He convinced Perpetua, the original creator of the multiverse, to choose him as her lieutenant over Lex Luthor, as his vision was limited by his ego. Then the Batman Who Laughs continued on with his own plans, eventually acquiring cosmic power and becoming a bigger threat than Perpetua herself. Yeah, that's right, this guy ends up gaining cosmic power. He ends up implanting his brain into the corpse of a version of Bruce Wayne who had Dr. Manhattan's abilities, giving the Batman who laughs near omnipotence. Yeah, this guy is the definition of overpowered. And not only that, but he's an absolute psychopath. He will gut you like a fish while your family watches and then make them play double dutch with your intestines and think that that was a boring weekend. This guy is absolutely insane. I know I said that the DCEU is dark, but this is even darker than they would go. There in my opinion is no way that they could introduce the Batman Who Laughs properly without making the movie rated R or literally just being unable to publish it. It's absolutely insane. So yeah, I don't think we'll be seeing him anytime soon.